Welcome to Mama Jara's Tales of the Summerland. Travel with Mama Jara's Tales of the Summerland. Listen to songs and stories from the African diaspora, from history, jazz, and blues songs, games, fairy and folk tales, and stories from famous authors such as Zora Neale Hurston and Senegal's Barago Dot. Detroiter Michelle Jara McKinney, an oral historian, jazz vocalist, librarian, and archivist, and the executive director of Detroit Sound Conservancy, a nonprofit community based music archive, has been spinning tales for over 40 years. She has plenty of culture to share with us. Thank you. That's wonderful. <laughs> That's me. So I'm just so honored to be here today. I, I, I love telling stories and this is a special occasion because it's close to Juneteenth and that's June 19th. So it's June 19th, they say, what is Juneteenth? And Juneteenth is a, 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 a holiday, it's a holiday. It's a cultural holiday, but it's, it's kind of bittersweet. Like, most Americans celebrate the 4th of July as Independence Day. We see all kinds of uh, uh, fireworks and picnics and all kinds of um, uh, music that's dun -da -dun, dun -da -da, you know, all wonderful. But that 4th of July, which celebrates the United States becoming a country and independent from its mother country, which was England, Juneteenth celebrates the final telling that the Civil War was ended and that the slaves were now free. So it gave notice to people who had no idea that they didn't have to be enslaved anymore. Uh, they didn't have to work for no money. They didn't have to suffer the lash and and horrible working conditions. They didn't have to suffer their children being taken away from them and their parents being taken away from them and all kinds of terrible things that happened during that time of slavery. So though this, uh, though this was, it's a celebration and from that, from Juneteenth, it grew into, it still affects us in a lot of different ways. I'll, I'll tell you some of the ways, but how did Juneteenth come about? So President Lincoln was in the middle of the Civil War and he was pulling his hair out. He was saying, oh my God, it looks like these people are really serious about t tearing up the United States. We won't be united anymore. It'll be two different countries and I can't do that. So what can I do to make this better? And so he thought, well, we need more people fighting for this union. So he decided that maybe he could tempt uh, a lot of the people who were enslaved to come over and help fight because he was noticing that a lot of, 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 of the enslaved called these people that ran away contraband. Contraband is a word meaning uh, some kind of property that has been um, uh, freed up. So they were thought of these people as chattel, as property. And, he, and they were growing and they were trying to feed these people. And he says, well, why don't I use the people who are, are escaping and the people who are still enslaved in the Confederate territories, let's use them as soldiers. So um, he wrote this Emancipation Proclamation, April 12, 1863, but I didn't go into effect until the, uh, uh, until the January following. And so in the proclamation, he says, okay, all you enslaved people who are in Confederate states, you are now free by the edict of the president of the United States. So because he said so, it was true. If you still considered yourself part of the United States. So it didn't make much noise in the Confederate States because they were at war and they didn't recognize him as being their president. 
So they kind of ignored it, but some people listened. So this did not free all the people who were enslaved in the United States, only the people who were in the Confederate States. So finally, the United States won, the North won the Civil War. And then the people were, uh, this, the slave owners, many of them had gone West, you know, uh, to, to be out of the brouhaha because most of the fighting was down where in Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, all those Southern states down there. But Texas was still part of the Confederacy, but it was off to the side a little bit. And so they could continue working those people without too much problems. So they realized that, you know, we, they didn't have telephones. They didn't have television. They didn't have any mass media communication. So a lot of people did not know that the Civil War had been won by the North. And so they were sending people out, letting people know, okay, they have surrendered. Your generals have surrendered. So you are now still in the United States. So this guy, Major General uh, Gordon Granger, he took two, almost 2,000 troops down with him to Texas. And they landed on this island called Galveston. And Galveston is right off the coast of Texas in the, in the Gulf area, that big, beautiful Gulf. And there he, he set up his, his, his uh, announcement. And he announced to tell the people, all the people, the slave owners and the enslaved people that you are now free. And this was on June 19, 1865. And this was two months after the end of the Civil War. So the people were like amazed. They had no, no idea. So they were saying, oh, I can go find Aunt Sally. Oh, I can go find my mama. Oh, I've got to find my babies. Everybody was all excited. And he said, hold it. Yeah, you might be free, but I advise you to stay right where you are. Stay where you are and just work for wages because there's nothing in place for you right now. There's nothing, I mean, there's no place you can go. Just stay where you are and your slave owners where are now will be your boss and you will work for wages. That's what he suggested. Now, <laughs> I don't know how many of the enslaved people listened to him, but from that time on, black people were considered to be free, but they had a lot of problems because the Southerners really, you know, that was breaking the bank. I mean, this was their property. And so a lot of them uh, came up with another way to keep the people enslaved in a way. So they became, uh, 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 they became sharecroppers, tenant farmers. They would rent like a piece of land to be on and the, and the boss would give them a, a, a mule, the seeds, the tools to plow the land. And so they became tenant farmers, but then they had to borrow everything from the, the boss, their food, the everything. And then they had to pay it back when the crops were turned in for sale. But somehow they always managed not to be able to save the money up and they are always in debt. So they became debt slaves. <laughs> and a lot of that has continued on through Jim Crow, which is like segregation. They had the black codes. And so this, this exploitation of black labor and black bodies still continues even to this day where we now have a wide gap between what people of uh, what black people make and what European Americans make. So it's, it's, it's really, I like, think like we make maybe a third something of what uh, other, other races make here in this country. So we are still on the bottom and they're talking about this thing called reparations, but all of that's still being talked about. And a lot of the cultural life came out of the, uh, the Juneteenth celebrations. I don't know if you've ever heard of the cakewalk. 
the cakewalk was like contests. Sometimes people would hold a cake on top of their head and they do this high kick it. They, need, uh, <laughs> they had to, whoever could keep the cake on. I mean, there was all kinds of ways to do the cakewalk. Sometimes they just dance and whoever was the best dancer would win a cake. So the cakewalk also made fun of the European Americans who had things like the minuet, the quadrille, and they'd be doing these dances. And so they pretended like they were, the black people pretended like they were white people doing these dances. And the white people were laughing. <laughs> look at those funny looking people. Look, look how they funny they look. And so that became the minstrel show. And so the white people just started to imitate the black people who they didn't know were imitating them. And so to imitate a black person, they would darken their faces with cork and they have black face. And so they would uh, start this thing called Tin Pan Alley. And Tin Pan Alley grew into Broadway in New York. And Broadway has all these musicals and, and all this kind of thing. All of that came from the minstrelsy. So the American culture has been uh, affected in many ways by what came out of Juneteenth and what came out of the end of slavery. So all of this is just to let you know <laughs> what Juneteenth is about, because even to this day, people are celebrating Juneteenth and they do it in different ways. Um, they're still looking for their family. So they have family reunions, uh, they have picnics and barbecues, they still have um, uh, anthems that they sing, like um, the Negro National Anthem or the Black National Anthem. It's called Lift Every Voice and Sing. So at some places, the, the, the show, the, the, uh, the procedure, the process, the ritual has that song in there because it's celebrating Black people and trying to uplift them. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven rings, rings with the harmonies of liberty. And it goes on like that. And so it's, it's a celebration. And so they sing that song to commemorate that they are now free people and that they are now full Americans. And full Americans in the sense that they had to have the 13th Amendment saying, you are free everywhere. So even though the Emancipation Proclamation freed the enslaved people in the Confederate territories, the 13th Amendment freed Black people all over the whole entire country. So it's uh, <laughs> the 14th Amendment gave us our civil rights and the 15th Amendment let black men, uh, gave black men suffrage so they could vote. And women didn't have it. No one woman had it. So we still had a ways to go. But we finally got the 20th Amendment <laughs> and, and 1920, I think that's the 20th Amendment. So I'd like to tell you a story because that's what we do too during uh, Juneteenth is tell stories that talk about the adaptability and the genius and the resilience of black people. And it came all Africa. And so I'd like to tell you a famous story about people who really lived. This is really, I guess it's kind of turned into a myth now, <laughs> but it's called, uh, it's a story called Only One Cowrie, a Dahomean story. And it is in your public library. I looked it up. You've got it in your library. And so if you like this story and you want to read it for yourself, you can go into the library and take it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me tell you about the story of Yao. Now, Yao was kind of a trickster, okay? He didn't have too savory of a uh, reputation. The book will tell you about that. But he was like the court jester. He was the one that made people laugh in the court because he was so witty and he was so smart. So um, it came about that the land of Dahomey 
was a whole lot of different ethnic tribes, ethnic groups that were constantly warring and fighting each other and saying, this is my boundary. You put your toe across my boundary. And so this, all this was going on, but this one person, his name was Dada Segbo. He had the gift of angels in his tongue. So he went around and talked to all the people and he didn't do it with might of arms. He made them a country by talking to them, reasoning with them, getting them to work together. And that's really the best way to become a country. So they became a country out of love. So they had a celebration celebrating him becoming the king. And then all the people were saying, yeah, we're great. You're a great guy. We're so glad you are a king. Oh, yes, oh, king, king. Hey, wait a minute. Where's the queen? He says, queen, I'm not married. We know you need a queen. He says, I don't need a queen. Yes, you need a queen. We need a queen. So you got to get a married. He says, oh boy. Okay, I'll get married. I, I understand that. But uh, I don't want to just marry anybody. And uh, she's got to be smart. She's got to be beautiful. She's got to be this, she got to be that. And he was talking about all the stuff she had to be. And the people agreed. They said, oh yeah. And they said, so let's get together a dowry and send out a messenger and, and get you a wife. He says, okay, you mean I have to give something? Because this king had one fault. He was very stingy. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. He didn't like to part with any of his goods. Okay, you can send somebody out to get me a wife, but I'm only going to pay one cowrie shell for her, her dowry. See, in those days, these shells were considered money. This is a cowrie shell. So <laughs> the people looked at him like he was crazy, uh, but... But you know, it generally takes like a thousand cowrie shells for a woman to, 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 to woo a woman correctly. He said, no, you have to find me a wife with this one cowrie shell. Okay, who's gonna go out there and be my messenger? Hmm? Silence. But then a little voice from the back said, I'll do it. And they looked around and it was Yao. Everybody laughed because they knew he was he was he was their comedian. <laughs> they said, oh, you gonna do you're gonna do this, right? Yeah, I'll do it. Sure. Hand it here. So the king gave him the cowrie. And he said, Okay, I will find you a wife with this one cowrie shit. That's just good. Go then. I'm gone. So he started to the market and he took that cowrie shell to the market. And he traded the cowrie shell for a flint. Now, a flint is like old fashioned matches. It's a stone that has a lot of metal in it. So when you strike it on another stone, sparks fly out. And if you have some dried grass there, it makes the grass catch on fire. And before you know it, you can build little twigs in there. And the next thing you know, you have a nice fire. So he got himself a flint. And he went on traveling down the road headed toward the, a nice big village where he knew he'd find a nice young lady for the king. He said, well, well, I'm doing well. All because of that sick Ah, And he saw a bush on, on the road and he said, oh, look at that bush is crawling crawling with grasshoppers. So I think I have an idea. I'm going to get these grasshoppers. They'll help me in my, in, my, in, my, in my road. So he lit his fire and he put little water on it and made it real smoky. And then he put a bag over the bush. All those grasshoppers says, oh, I can't breathe. We got to get out of here. And they all jumped into the bag. And before he knew it, he had a whole bag, I mean, a big bag full of all these wriggling, jumping, hollering grasshoppers. He, he tied a knot on the top, threw it over his shoulder and said, ha, 
I'm sure I'll be able to get something with this. And so he started down the road singing his song. Now you heard his song. I want you to learn his song. So you repeat after me. Well, well, I'm doing well. What? Well, well, I'm doing well. That's good. <laughs> All because of Dr. Sick Bullshit. All because of Dr. Sick Bullshit. And he went on down the road, but he came to a strange sight. He saw a woman feeding her chickens, but she wasn't using corn. She was using field beans, you know, like black eyed peas, field beans. And she was scattering up and the chickens were going and they're eating up these beans. He says, why, uh, uh, excuse me, mama, but why are you feeding your chickens beans? And she said, my grain hasn't come in yet. It's coming in in a few days, but I, I, I have this, these, these chickens to feed and they're getting into it anyway. So I just might as well let them have it. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I got something that'll be better for you, for your chickens than those old beans. Here, let me open this up a little bit. So he shook the bag to make all the grasshoppers go, Ooh! and he let the grasshoppers out, a little bit of them out. And the, those chickens was on those grasshoppers like white on rice. They just ate them up. So he gave her some of those grasshoppers to tie her over until her grain came in. And she said, young man, thank you very much. I surely appreciate it. Here, why don't you take a bag of these beans? They were gonna eat them anyway. And she took up this huge bag of beans. He said, really? Uh, well, you don't have to? I know I don't have to. I want you to have it. He says, well, thank you. So he took on the bag of beans on the other shoulder and he had a light bag of grasshoppers on that shoulder. And he says, wow, thank you. And he went on his road. Well, well, I'm doing well. All because of God's sick bullshit. Your turn. Well, well, I'm doing well. All because of Dada Sick Bullshell. And he start walking and he noticed that there are these guys fishing, but they were all sitting by the boat looking like this. He said, what's the matter? You're supposed to be out there fishing. What's going on? We don't have any bait. The fish just aren't coming into our nets. Oh, I got bait for you. Why don't you use these field peas? He said, peas? Yeah, the fish will eat them up. I, I, I've used peas for fishing. Really? So they said, oh, we'll try it. So they went and spread the nets near the boats and he threw out some peas, threw out some beans. I mean, threw them out. And those fish said, what's that? And they came up and started eating up the beans. And they flopped right into those nets. So oh my goodness. Wow. All these fish. Oh, yeah. Okay. There you go. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, before you go, we're going to give you some of this fish. And these fish are just are flipping and flopping all around. And they got them into this big bag. And they said, here you go. He said, wow. Thank you, uh, I'll take it. So he put him on top of the grasshoppers and he stopped on down the road. Well, well, I'm doing well. All because of Dada Sick Bullshit. I got the shell and he gave me flint. I got the flint and he gave me hoppers. I got the hoppers. And it gave me beans, I got the beans. And it gave me fish, yeah, yeah, I'm doing well. All because I got a sick bullshell. Hey, what's the matter with you? 
he was walking by and there's this guy sitting on his doorstep. But his doorstep was the opening to a forge. He was a blacksmith. And he was sitting up there with his head in his hands looking all sorrowful. I said, what's the matter? I'm trying to finish this, this order I got for some tools and I'm just hungry and I'm, I'm not gonna walk my way to my house. I, it's just too far. I just need to rest for a bit and then I, I'll have the energy. Oh, I'll help you. I, I got all this fish up here. Here, let me make you a fire. So he made a fire, put two little uh, Y-shaped sticks down, put a, a spear, a spear some of the fish and they put it on top of the little, little uh, stand and he started turning that fish over the fire. And before you know it, they were eating hot fish. <gasps> Oh, oh, mm, mm, oh, that's so good. Oh, wow. Mm, mm. I don't know if you've ever had fish that comes off a of fire, but it's delicious. So they had like three fish apiece. <laughs> and then he let, left the, the blacksmith with a whole bunch of fish. Blacksmith says, you are wonderful. Thank you so much. You rescued me. I feel great. I feel ready to go back to work. Here, but before you go, let me give you some of these tools. I mean, I mean, I, I made met much more than I was going for the order. So you can take these. So he came a huge, he wrapped up a huge big old bag full of all kinds of machetes, shovels, axes, picks, anything that you need to till the ground and, and chop a tree or get some vines out the way. He just gave him all these wonderful, shiny new tools. He said, are you, are you, I mean, for some fish? Yeah, you helped gave me, I'll be able to finish in time. Thank you. Oh, okay. So he balanced that on top of his back and went on down the road, singing his song. Well, well, I'm doing well. All because of Dr. Sigmoshe. Let me hear you sing. I'm doing well. All because I got a sick shell. He's going along, and all of a sudden he saw a field, and there was these guys, and they had like kitchen knives, and they were trying to dig some big old rocks out of the ground. What y'all doing over there? Oh, we're trying to get this field ready for planting with some dinner knives no y'all come here come here over here look i got something you can use so he took out some of the tools and he gave them what they needed to really till that field and the farmers were amazed oh, okay oh, can you stay and wait for while we use no no you can have them take them look at that big field you gotta do and the guy said oh thank you so much <laughs> I don't know how to repay you. Oh, you don't have to repay me. Wait, 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 wait. My wife just made, she just pressed a whole lot of oil. Let me give you some oil and flour. That's, that's what we have. So he went in the house and came out with this huge cask of oil. He just rolled it on out. And, and, and uh, yeah, I said, I can't take that with me. And they said, oh, well, here's a gourd. Here's a huge, a long gourd. So they, they, a gourd is this well, a gourd is a gourd. <laughs> it's a long calabash. So the guy filled up this gourd with this oil and he put a stopper of wax on it. And he put a, and puts a stopper in it so that it wouldn't come leak out. And so he tied some string and, and, and looped it over Yao's body so that it could just drape on the side. He says, you can carry that now. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, unexpected. On down the road, y'all. He sang, well, well, I'm doing well. All because of Dada Segbo Shell. I got, I got shell. And I got a flint, I got the flint. And I got some hoppers, got the hoppers. And I got some beans, I got the beans. And I got some fish, got the fish. And I got some tools, got the tools. And look, I got some oil. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing well. All because of Dada Segbo Shell. Young lady, because he was walking by 
he was very near the village now. He could hear the children playing. And there was this little bakery that was right outside of, of the village gate. And the young lady was sitting there and she looked just like the blacksmith had looked. She just looked really upset. What's the matter? <sighs> I have an order here for bread, but the person who brings me oil didn't show up. And how can I make bread without oil? You need oil? Seriously? Seriously? I got oil. Here, go get me a gourd and I'll, I'll share this oil with you. You have oil? Oh, okay, here, here, here's a gourd. So he poured a goodly portion in there. She says, oh my goodness, this will last me for a month. Oh, thank you so much. Wait, wait right there, I'm gonna make you some bread. So she starts whipping that stuff together and they have these clay up, these clay ovens and you slap that dough in there and it puffs up into this nice delicious bread. So she just popped that bread up there and made all this bread and came from this big, oh, bundle of hot, fresh bread. He said, wow, thank you so much. Oh, no, thank you. Wow, I'm really ready to find a wife now. Thank you. I'm going to go on my road. I'm almost there. Now it's getting toward evening. So he went into there and asked the children, where's, the, where's your chief? Oh, there he is. So he went up to the chief and says, your chief, your chiefness. I am Yao, the messenger of King Dada Segbo. And I am looking for a queen for our king. Would you have any beautiful young maidens here who might fit the bill? Why, I certainly do. My daughter. We're getting ready to celebrate her birthday. That's what all the preparations are for. Uh, I, I, you, you're looking for a queen? My daughter is very smart and very beautiful. She would fit the bit. Oh, wow. So she's a young lady, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's her 18th birthday today. She's very young, very beautiful, and very smart, if I say so myself. Well, I, I, can this be her betrothal party then? Why, certainly I'll make the announcement. How, and look here, I have all these things for dowry. I have uh, grasshoppers you can feed chickens with. Uh, I have beans, I have all of these goods here. Why, this is wonderful. Oh, this is a wonderful dowry. Well, yes, thank you, welcome. Hey, a servant, you take him someplace where he can freshen up and get ready for the, for the betrothal ceremony. So, but unbeknownst to everybody, the princess was listening and she heard that she was about to be married to somebody. She said, what? So she followed the servant and Yao to the little place where he was gonna freshen up. And she overheard him bragging. He was bragging to the servant. Oh, <laughs> King Dada Segbo gave me this one little cowrie shell <laughs> and I found him a wife for one cowrie shell, isn't that amazing? And the servant said, that certainly is. Oh, I don't know if they would like it, but yeah, that's great, wow. And so the servant went on off and she said, oh, excuse me, sir, can I speak with you? Oh, sure. We're able to get a wife for the King Dada with one cowrie shell? <laughs> yeah, just what well, that's all he gave me to, to find her with uh, one cowrie. But you know, I got some things on the way. Oh, how'd you do that? So he told her the story of how he had traded and swapped and how he tried to help people. And through helping them, they helped him back. Oh, that's interesting. Well, uh, you better call that servant back. Uh, yes, yes, because I am the princess. He, he, took, he says, oh, you're beautiful. Why, thank you. Um, we're going to be celebrating my party. And this is a special. We shouldn't, don't need to eat this regular food. You should send uh, and tell uh, Dada Segbo that he needs to send some food and drink for all of my relations, everybody in this village. And um, we're about to have dinner in about a mm, couple of hours, so you better hurry. Okay. Uh oh, did you hear a servant? 
send your fastest runner and tell King Dada that, that, that we found his wife, but we need more food and drink for the feast. Yes, sir, I will go. So they sent the fastest runners. <laughs> ran. And they got to Dada Segbo. <sighs> King, you have a queen, but to, in order to celebrate her betrothal ceremony, we need to have a feast for the party. Can you send food and wine and drink? Oh, of course. Everyone gather together, the fastest runners, take all the good food and drink for the party. And they got that together and they got together. Ooh, 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 ooh. Hustled up back down that road. And they went much faster than, than, than Yao did. He was ambling along trade and stuff. They went zippity quick and they got to the party just when people were sitting down to eat. And oh my goodness, they had millet, roast yam, they had lamb, they had all kind of wonderful foods there to eat. And the people were drinking the palm wine and laughing and celebrating that their daughter was going to be the queen of the country. Oh my goodness. So she was watching her people enjoy themselves. And she said, Yao, may I speak with you? So Yao comes over there. Yes, my queen. Um, I think that since I didn't know I was going to be a queen, I don't have the right clothes. I don't have any clothes. I don't have any queen clothes. You need to send a runner back there to King Dada and tell him that if he wants not to be embarrassed by the woman sitting by his side, he needs to send some jewelry. He needs to send some fabric, some clothes, and some gowns for me. And he needs to send some for you because you're looking kind of dusty. Mm -hmm. And they need to get here before I leave in the morning. Oh, you're right. Uh, okay. Uh, 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 runner. Yes. Go to King Donna and tell him he got to send jewels. He got to send jewels, clothes, and something for me too. And, and do it quick. <laughs> you got to be ready to go tomorrow morning. He says, oh, uh, yes, I will go. And he goes running down. King Dada, your queen said you got to send her some clothes. And he told him all that he had to send. And King said, hey, my servants, all my queens, everybody, get stuff together. We got to send jewels, clothing, and some for y'all for our party tomorrow. Get it together. Make it beautiful. So the women, they were sewing, sewing stuff together, putting our stuff together and they, they made this big trunk and it had diamonds and it had jewelry, it had cowrie shells, they had rubies, uh, emeralds. I mean, they had all kinds of precious stones that were sewn quickly into the clothing and they made it fit for a queen. So the bearers put it on their shoulders and they... <laughs> so meanwhile, it came they, people went to sleep after the feast and the, the queen had a beautiful bath. She perfumed herself and the runners came with the trunk of clothes. She opened the trunk and there were gorgeous gowns. Oh my goodness. Oh, this fits perfectly. Oh, that's beautiful, but I'm not gonna wear that. Oh, look at this. So she went through the whole trunk and guess what she picked? She found the most beautiful dress encrusted in, you guessed, in cowrie shells. <laughs> so she found a beautiful crown, it had cowrie shells on it, and she just looked simply beautiful. She, well, she looked like a queen. And she sent the little article that they brought for Yao to wear, so he looked resplendent too. So she stepped into her little coach. They had a chair that had an umbrella over it and then strong men picked it up and they went on down the road to where King Dada lived. They were going down the road. And the people all along the path, a lot of her people went with her and they were singing and dancing and celebrating that their daughter was now queen of the country. When they came, they because of course some people had run ahead and said, Your wife is here. So he got King Dada got on his throne 
with all of his beauty and all of his wonderful crown on and looking all kingly and stuff. And they brought the chair right in front. When she stepped out of that chair, when she stepped out of that chair, his mouth went because she was one of the most beautiful women he had ever seen in his life. Very young, very pretty, regal and smart as a whip. She came down there, my husband, and he got off that throne and my wife kissed her hand and he embraced her. And all the people just said, yeah, yeah, we got a queen. And he seated her next to him in his chair. And he was thinking, <laughs> I got this fabulous woman all for one calorie. <laughs> yes, my dear. And she was thinking in her head, hmm, thought that he was going to pay just one calorie for me. Well, he spent a lot of money on that feast. He spent a lot of money on that palm wine. He spent a lot of money on these clothes and these dresses. And <clears throat> I'm gonna work this man. He's gonna respect me. Oh, yes, my dear husband. <laughs> and the king said, we all owe this wonderful event to one person, my my friend Yao. Come Yao, I want to give you a present. And Yao said, oh, a gift for me? Oh, okay. So Yao steps up with my present. And the king said, here is your present. I'm gonna give you a cowrie. And Yao said, thank you, king. Thank you, King Dada. Wow. And I could tell you the story about how he took that cowrie shell and he went to the market and he found a, a, a yam seller and it had all kind of, he got an old yam with all the eyes in it. He chopped that yam up, he gave her the cowrie shell and he took that big, beautiful, their yams are huge. He took that yam, he chopped it up and he planted it on a field that the king gave him and he became a very rich man. But that's another story. But Yao was saying as he walked away with that cowrie shell, well, well, I'm doing well. All because of the sick bullshit. Your turn. Sing with me. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing well. All because of the sick bullshit. And that's the end of my story. And that's why I thought this story was perfect for you, Juneteenth, because. Black people have had to be very resourceful. And even when things look bad and they didn't seem to have enough to make do, somehow they would make it work. And they still are like that to this very day. Ask your mama. <laughs> As my mama, she tells me. <laughs> well, well, we're doing well. Because of what I tell. <laughs>